live to episode number 16 of the primetime rundown zoom interview series right here on the eastern observer and the blackjack media networks i'm joey jarzinka we are we are welcomed by alex katz uh current kansas city royals relief pitcher alex welcome to the show buddy uh it's been a long time since you and i have seen each other how are things going with you right now uh amidst this whole pandemic yeah first thanks for having me and Everything's been been pretty good, you know, just staying sharp, staying ready, uh, waiting for that call, whether it's in the next week or next two months. Who yeah, knows? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, I, obviously with uh, with it being a crummy day today and, uh, you know, I do apologize for taking you in, uh, you know, or bringing you inside. Uh, you know, obviously it's, uh, you know, as we said, a crummy day, but I'm sure you got your bullpen session in today, even though it was uh, beyond wet outside, right? Yeah, well, no, yesterday was bullpen day, so I got it in in a, in a nice day. Yes, sir, it was beautiful outside. Good, good. Glad to hear that. So, uh, so glad to hear that you guys are doing well, and, uh, and let's get things started. For those that do not know, or this is the first time that you guys have been watching the Primetime Rundown Zoom interview series, it's a byproduct of our uh, flagship podcast, the Primetime Rundown. And uh, for all of the guests that I have on our show, uh, it's everyone that I have r- basically run into, have gotten to know, and have become friends with uh, during my five years in the sports industry. So for those that want to know how Alex and I met, well, that was through uh, a close friend of ours, a mutual connection in Chicago Cubs hitting coach Anthony Iaposi at the uh, 2017 Iaposi Baseball con- uh, Convention uh, at Division Avenue High School in Nassau County. So uh, small world as uh, as – Actually, we were at one point, we didn't even know it. We were uh, actually classmates or peers, if you will, um, when he went to St. John's, and that's where we'll get into. Uh, but let's get to know Alex Katz a little bit more, shall we? Uh, so high school on Long Island, that's where you are now. That's where you live. Um, baseball is the route that you've wanted to take all these years, I would assume. Um, was it, though, Alex? Was baseball the route that you wanted to go down? And how long has it been? Um, that you've wanted to play baseball? Yeah, I think ever since the beginning of Little League, um, you know, being a professional baseball player was a dream of mine and obviously hasn't changed since then. So, um, you know, pretty much most of my life, I remember maybe when I was two, three, four years old, I wanted to be a carpenter just because I saw my dad do a lot of housework um, with uh, him and a buddy. But, you know, it probably went from being a carpenter to uh, being a baseball player fairly quickly. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, being a, you know, being a carpenter, doing, uh, you know, doing things with your hands and then obviously taking the pull by the horn and, uh, and heading the baseball route. And obviously uh, that has paid off for you, but we will get to that in just a few moments. But um, you went to high school at Herrick's uh, second team, all Long Island selection and all County uh, honoree is a senior. Um, You were named MVP of the Nassau County Exceptional Senior Game. Uh, You earned a 2012 honorable mention, uh, Rawlings Perfect Game Preseason All-American, and first team All-Northeast Region Accolades. So coming out of high school, Alex, and getting offers from, I would assume, all around uh, Division I, and you chose St. John's. If you don't, if, if you would like to bring up another place where you were, I would say offered, were, were there other places that, uh, that offered you? St. John's was the first school to give me a scholarship offer and I committed the next day, but, um, I was definitely talking to other schools, including Stony Brook, uh, some Ivy league schools, uh, Duke, uh, Boston college. Um, so a lot of good academic and athletic, uh, programs yeah there's no doubt about it and especially with st john's uh 2000 2013 to 2015 you were there uh for three years and you played under uh current head coach for or current manager if you will for the brooklyn cyclones uh ed blankmeyer um and with as you were getting courted with other offers such as stony brook and potentially going down the same route as uh as closer Joe Nathan, um, you know, why St. John's was there a specific reason besides, um, you know, the obvious with the, um, major league baseball, um, connections. 
Yeah, uh, I I had two prior instances um, with with St. John. So a little bit of history there. So um, I think I was around 13 or 14 playing travel ball. We actually um, got to go on the field for the national anthem um, at St. John's at Jack Kaiser Stadium. And, um, you know, our whole team went went to the went to that game. I think it was St. John's versus Princeton, a, a midweek game. Um, so I remember going on campus and, and watching those guys play back then. And then I remember going to the first game at, at City Field. It was St. John's versus Georgetown and um, snuck. You know, I, I don't think I had good seats that game, but I snuck behind the St. John's dugout and was in the St. John's family section talking to all the families. They loved the program. So just had, um, you know, just had good vibes from being around um, the program just on two instances. And. I think from that city field game on out, it was a dream of mine to play at St. John's, especially knowing that, um, you know, they, they were close enough for my family to watch me play and definitely uh, one of the top programs in the Northeast. Yeah, absolutely. And with, uh, you know, with having, with having such a storied program uh, going all the way back to Jack Kaiser, Joe Russo, Ed Blankmeyer, uh, the list goes on. Um you played three seasons there. Um, I really want to know, Alex, with you majoring in sport management, um, could have sworn you played there four years, but I, I was I was off. Uh, your favorite memory um, of playing at St. John's, whether it be Jack Kaiser Stadium, on the road. Um, obviously, I'll give a little spoiler alert. I would assume probably it was one game at TD Ameritrade Field in Omaha, but I could – wrong let's hear your uh yeah so um we we went to tdm trade park um twice we played against creighton in the regular season because that's that's where they play their home games um and obviously biggies conference games i actually pitched in i think every biggie series except creighton so i didn't pitch there in the regular season and then the biggies tournament i believe we only played three games I was in the bullpen warming up for I think each of the three and was about to come in and finish out the championship game but um McCormick ended up coming in and and doing doing the job so I didn't actually pitch in the Big East tournament so I never pitched at TD Ameritrade Park but I pitched a few times in the regionals I pitched um I pitched in two out of the three regional games and started the regional championship game Wow. But, um, so, so you never, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So you never pitched in the big East tournament that year that you guys won. Yeah, no, we played six games that year at TD Ameritrade. I did not pitch in one of those games, three of them, wow. I believe in the big East three in the regular season. Um, but to answer, to answer your question, I'd say my, my favorite memory was pitching in the regional in the regionals at Oklahoma state in my, during my junior year. Um, we had a good run and, um, I started the game, the regional championship against Arkansas. It was a 0-0 game going into the fifth inning. So a really good game. We ended up losing, but, um, you know, we definitely we definitely fought hard. And my last batter that I faced in college was Andrew Penintendi, which is uh, pretty surprising, you know, with thousands of players playing Division One in all different divisions. You know, I ended up, the last batter I faced was the Golden Spikes Award winner. It's absolutely crazy where for those that do not know or, um, you know, for those that are not baseball fans that are just tuning in, Andrew Benintendi, left fielder for the Boston Red Sox. That is uh, that is some pretty cool stuff there. Um, so now, obviously, you said that you didn't play in the in that Big East tournament in your final year, in your junior year. But now I have to ask this question anyway. You're a part of the team. And we actually had a former teammate of yours on just a few episodes ago, uh, Kevin McGee. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and I had asked him about the feeling of pitching at TD Ameritrade Park and winning a Big East championship. Now, I didn't get the exact word from him, but I've heard from multiple people and for the a lot of the guests that I've have 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 had on, excuse me, whether it be athletes, whoever it may be, um, and winning a championship, whether it be the Stanley Cup, whether it be a World Series, or in your in your instance, um, a Big East championship. What is the feeling like? Is it similar to a word like euphoria? 
Yeah, I completely agree with that word. Um, you know, I think just a culmination of all the hard work that you put on and off the field um, really, you know, adds up to that final moment when, you know, everyone's, everyone's, you know, ru rushing the, rushing to the mound or, you know, the field and jumping on each other and pouring Gatorade on each other. Um, it's really a feeling that's hard to describe. And if you haven't done it before, you know, it, you just don't understand what it's like, you know, and, and, um, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't been a part of, um, you know, a dog pile like that in a while. So you kind of, you kind of lose what that, that feeling's like. Yeah. And, and also you want it to, you know, like, do you, do you have the feeling of, you know, when, when you do it once you get that spoiled feeling of you're hungry to do it again? Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely athletes that have made it far in, in professional sports who never experienced that. Um, I'm sure there's some Hall of Famers in, in multiple sports that have never won a championship. So that is interesting to think about. You know, obviously, these are some of the best athletes ever in in sports and they don't know what it's like to win, you know, so um, that that is weird to think about. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy to even, you know, to think, especially when you go to St. John's, uh, it's it's continuous winning, whether it be yeah. uh, having having uh, historical regular seasons um, or winning multiple championships in the Big East and eventually getting to uh, to the to the regionals. Now, um, you spoke about you spoke about your last batter being the aforementioned Andrew Benintendi, but playing in the NCAA tournament um, and, you know, a completely different completely different um, plethora of opponents that you most likely would not be playing in, you know, in the beginning of the season or during a midweek non-conference matchup. Um, how, what was your mindset, especially against not only Ben Attendee, but pitching against Oklahoma state? It's a humongous um it's, it's a different, it's a different level of baseball and I'm not undermining the big East. It's just, you know, there's, there's different levels um, throughout college and throughout the country and Oklahoma. You, uh, it froze. Alex, can you hear me? Yeah. You froze for, uh, for a second. Okay. So I miss that. I missed the second part of the question. Okay. Hold on. Let's see if we can get Alex back. Okay. Are you there? Yep. yep I okay, hear you now. Cool. All right, cool. Excellent. So just to repeat, so just to repeat that question. Um, so obviously playing in the NCAA tournament and you were saying about um, playing against Oklahoma state in your final start, um, you know, you're playing against different, different opponents and teams that you normally would not be uh, playing during a midweek non-conference, um, I would say warm up, if you will, for those weekend conference games. Um, what, what was the feeling like for you to go up against a, a, a great team such as Oklahoma State, but also um, from a different conference who I would assume, I don't know, I don't know the exact teams that you faced, but I'm assuming Oklahoma state is the first, uh, or that would be the first time that you've ever faced them, uh, in your three-year career. Yeah. So the, the regional had, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma state and Arkansas. So I pitched against all, I pitched against two to three teams. I didn't pitch against Tulsa. Um, but pitching at St. John's and pitching in, uh, you know, Big East baseball division one, it, it's very interesting because, um, you know, you, we usually start the season against, um, ACC, SEC, um, caliber schools, um, maybe PAC 12 schools. Then we come home and play, uh, midweek games against more local schools, which obviously aren't as strong as those teams down South or out West. And then we start conference play. And I think the Big East conference is very mixed with talent. Um, I think there are some really, really good teams, but I don't think the baseball conference is as strong as my freshman year when we had Louisville, UConn, and schools like that. Um, but th there is some really good competition in the Big East, um, you know, especially schools like Creighton and Seton Hall. Um, 
you know, so we're playing them every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, probably for, I don't know, seven weeks straight. Then we have the biggest tournament, which is super competitive. Not every team makes a tournament. Um, I think only the top four or six teams make it. And then, um, you know, going into the regionals, it's the same caliber teams that we played in the beginning of the year, but now we're more ready. You know, we, we typically struggled early on because some teams were more ready than us being outside and being in the warm weather. But, um, you know, it's a totally different ball game once we played those teams again in, in May, June. Uh, we're just as competitive or even better than a lot of those schools. But uh, my junior year, we opened up at Georgia Tech, you know, legitimate program. And um, I'm not sure how we did against them. It was a while. I forgot. But, um, you know, we pitching at, we played against them. I think a week or two later, we played at Oregon. Um, those were competitive games. I remember uh, Tom Hackamer and I no hit them for nine innings straight. And um, I think we lost in like the 13th or 14th inning. But, um, you know, just playing against those high caliber schools and even scrimmaging our own team. We had on that 2015 team, um, when it's all said and done, I think um, must have been 15 guys drafted from that whole, from that team of 35. So almost half the team got drafted, I think, or maybe a little less, maybe a third of the team got drafted. So even just scrimmaging our own guys before the season, it, it gets you ready. It gets you prepared. You know, you're, you're pl practicing and playing against um, high, you know, extremely talented players all the time. And that gets you ready. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, and, and you, and you hit the nail right on the head because um, the last few years, and I know in my senior year, um, at St. John's trying to call a baseball game at St. at, uh, at Jack Kaiser stadium was, you know, it, it was horrible because every, every other game was, um, was either delayed or it was simply postponed or simply canceled. And, uh, and the only time that we would be able to do anything would be, um, you know, either on the road or we'd have to go to Cincinnati to, uh, to the big East tournament, which, Obviously now uh, that's where it moved from. It moved from a whole different site, a whole bunch of different sites, and now is uh, at the home of Xavier uh, in Cincinnati at Prasco Park. But um, you said it. It's it's cold. You can't go outside a lot. It's you know it's basketball season. Um, you know everything. But you know obviously a lot of these teams that you're facing, such as Georgia Tech, as you said, um, they they could be outside all year round where they are down South or, you know, out West or even in the middle of the country. Um, it's substantially warmer for sure. Um, now let's go to the journey uh, to major league baseball and, or we'll continue the journey if we will. Um, so following, following your time at St. John's majored um, in sport management, your journey to Major League Baseball happens in 2015, where you were drafted in the 27th round by the Chicago White Sox. Um, now, you were talking about the, the feeling of jumping in the dog pile when winning a Big East championship. Now, how about hearing your name or reading your name along the ticker when you're drafted? Yeah, it was honestly one of the most frustrating days that turned into an extremely exciting day because um, I was drafted in the 27th round, I think 802nd pick. So to hear 801 other people called before you is uh, was extremely frustrating. There were points where I didn't think I was even going to get drafted, um, you know, and having a, a fairly decent or, you know, pretty decent junior year and obviously finishing really strong with some really good outings in the, in the regionals, um, you know, and talking to some teams that, and being told that I was going to get drafted a lot higher. Um, you know, I, there was a lot of confusion on draft day, but once I finally heard my name called, um, it was a sigh of relief and turned into one of the best days of my life. Well, now that was actually the next question that I was going to say is, is that, you know, as the names are coming off the board, and, you know, the alternative, you know, you think, you think to yourself, okay, you know, all these, these negative thoughts, am I going to get drafted? What do I do? Um, where does life take me? Do I go, you know, am I going to get signed as an undrafted free agent? How does that work for you? Um, what was the alt, what was the alter, the possible alternative for you? 
um, if you weren't drafted? Um, I didn't. I personally didn't think there was any chance that I wasn't going to get drafted. I mean, with all the rounds and, you know, I knew I was only 20 years old, a lefty, you know, throwing the ball low to mid nineties, had a good year, you know, I, you know, just, I try to be as honest as possible. And I, I didn't think there was a chance that, you know, maybe 1500 picks. I didn't think there was a chance that I wouldn't be at least one of those 1500 picks, um, you know, after just tying everything together. So really I, I didn't even think about the chance of not getting drafted I'm, until draft day when I, when I heard 800 names called ahead of me. So there really was, there were really, really weren't any other thoughts that crossed my mind. That's pretty good. That, that is, that is very positive, especially when you wait, you know, you wait 800 picks later and, you know, you eventually hear your name, but then after, you know, 500 or 600 and with the amount of rounds that there are in major league, excuse me, in major league baseball in their draft, obviously this year is different with only five. Um, you know, you think to yourself, okay, it's, you know, at some point, you know, a little negative thought, but you were able to keep it all positive, which is fantastic. Um, so you get drafted, as you said, 802nd overall, 2015 Chicago White Sox. That is your new home. Um, the Great Fall Voyagers, the advanced rookie affiliate of the White Sox in the Rookie Pioneer League. Uh, this is the road to the big leagues. Now, I want to know this, and I think everyone else wants to as well. We, but when your road um, to the big leagues obviously makes this stop, and obviously with minor league baseball, there are many stops before you get to, uh, to the show. A day in the life of Alex Katz in the Rookie League what was different from your time at St. John's to your time in rookie ball? Yeah. So um, I think it was a pretty smooth transition. Um, I'm a firm believer that it's much harder to go from high school to college than it is from college to pro ball, especially, you know, finish, finishing up the year playing against big, you know, big 12 schools, like, uh, you know, like we played against, it was a, um, very similar competition. It might have even been better competition towards end of college than the beginning of pro ball. You know, obviously maybe, you know, maybe some more talent in pro ball and those rookie level leagues, but a lot of guys are super, super inexperienced, you know, especially those, um, you know, 16 year olds or 18 year olds um, that were recently assigned ton of pure talent, but, you know, not super, super experienced. So, um, you know, I think my experience from college definitely helped me transition well into pro ball. Um, as far as a lifestyle, I started in AZL. I was there for a few weeks before going to Great Falls. And, um, you know, the AZL, the games are basically played at your complex. Um, we had an off day every four days. Um, we got fed steak and like good meals every single day. So when I, when I was playing there, um, I thought it was all sunshine and roses. I thought, you know, I do well. It's going to be a smooth, easy process. You know, like I put up good numbers and I'll move to the next level. And I put up good numbers, I'll move up to the next level. You know, I had really no idea what what um, what um, it really took to, to keep making it and keep moving forward and really how difficult it is. Um, I think it was more of an awakening when I got moved up to Great Falls um, and, you know, saw the clubhouse meals that we had and, um the type of living not really living conditions but just the light the minor league lifestyle and playing in an old minor league ballpark and the bus rides and stuff like that because in the azl you know half the time you're playing against the dodgers which you're literally just walking across uh, uh a little makeshift river in your complex to play them so um there's no fans and the mac the longest bus ride is probably 30 minutes so it's it's definitely a big difference from uh the azl to the short season league that's wild. Just, you know, just by walking over, over the little river and you're playing the Dodgers. And even as you said, like a 30 minute bus ride, that's fantastic because, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, the time in college where it could be, uh, you know, you're sitting in traffic trying to go over and play fairly Dickinson and it takes you three hours to get there. It's, uh, it's brutal or, you know, or a plane ride in to Creighton and it takes you, you know, three hours uh, by plane. Um, yep. so, Moving forward with your, yeah, moving forward with your time, um, you know, in the, in, in, um, in minor league baseball, then you eventually got to uh, uh, the Canapolis uh, Intimidators now called the Cannonballs. 
um, the Class A affiliate for the White Sox. And you were also at uh, Winston-Salem as well. Um, talk about your time now in the next league, or I guess one, one up in the Carolina League, uh, 2016, as we go in chronological order uh, of the life of Alex Katz. Yeah, so I started the 2016 year in uh, in Lowe, like you said, with Kannapolis. Um, I think I started started off doing well, and then um, um, I think I did poorly for a, a week or so, and uh, got sent back to Arizona to instructional league. I was there for I think a week and a half, maybe. Completely changed my mechanics over. They kind of look funny. I looking back, I kind of. Uh, I kind of wish my mechanics didn't look like that. That was kind of my decision because I was too slow to the plate. You know, guys were stealing on me. So I had to figure out a new leg lift. Um, but I actually got sent back to Kannapolis and pitched really well with those weird mechanics and then actually got promoted to uh, high A and did really well there. I think I only gave up um, one run in three or four games. So I, I finished strong there. And, um, you know, Kannapolis is a, uh, you know, obviously they got a new ballpark this year, so pretty old school ballpark there. And then, um, you know, once I got called up to Winston-Salem, it, it kind of felt like the big leagues a little bit because that stadium is beautiful. And, um, you know, the clubhouse is like a major league clubhouse, um, separate cafeteria. The amenities were, were um, you know, a hundred times better than Canapolis. So it felt like a huge upgrade. And, and I, I was really happy once I got that promotion. Yeah. So as I see, as the years are going on, I see the food is getting better where uh, wherever you go. That's uh, oh yeah. That is that is, say that is pretty good, especially all uh, all from the White Sox. Now uh, this is this is the um, this is the biggest thing here. And uh, and as I was asking you earlier about you know the possibility of not getting drafted now. We have seen um, everyone, almost everyone. Um, it's rare nowadays that you stay with one team. And for you, um, you were traded to the Baltimore Orioles uh, for two international pool spots. And, uh, and now we start a new journey for you. Um, you're closer to home um, and you are now on the East Coast again. So let's, let's break this down, Alex. You are traded from Chicago to Baltimore. Now, the feeling that goes through your mind when you get that phone call. The first thing that came to mind, I think it was a 10-second conversation with uh, the front office, basically telling you I was traded. They didn't say what I was traded for. So the first thing that came to mind was, what am I traded for? And I think as soon as I hung <laughs> up the phone, all the guys all on my team were on the field shagging BP, so nobody was in the clubhouse really. Um First thing I did was go on, on my phone on Twitter and just search my name, see if see who I was traded for. And I think 15, 20 minutes later, I saw it. And then my phone started blowing up. Um, so it, it's really weird to be traded, especially during the season. Um, you know, when you're just starting to get into the swing of things and find, trying to get your groove and getting to know your new teammates. And now all of a sudden you're uh, – now kind of interrupting everybody else's groove. Not, not really, not literally, but um, more figuratively, you know, just being the new face, you know, already a, a few, a few, um, a few games deep. Usually, usually when there's a new face in the clubhouse, it's a guy from maybe the lower level being promoted. And you, you met the guy in spring training, but being a totally new face uh, from a different organization, it is a little bit weird. Right. Yeah. Especially because, you know, you're, you're basically restarting and it, you have to go basically back almost a year to when you were drafted and you're meeting brand new players, brand new coaches. Um, you know, they may all have, I would say the coaches, you know, different, uh, you know, different things for you to try um, possibly. Now, when you, when you eventually got um, to Baltimore or you got to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, the Class A affiliate, Frederick. Um, it, when you get there, what's the feeling like? Again, you were saying you didn't want to interrupt anyone's groove. You, I'm assuming you slid right in and you felt fine, you know, after a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I knew some guys on the team, um, you know, played against a lot of those guys the year before. They were on Delmarva. I was with Kannapolis. 
So I, I knew a lot of the guys and we connected pretty quickly. Um, so it, it wasn't too big of a transition on that. And I think the biggest transition was going to a new organization and, um, you know, learning their new philosophies and um, reworking how I pitch during the season when the numbers, the numbers really count. Yeah. So, you know, you keep your head up as high as possible. Um, and then, and then moving forward after, um, your stint in Baltimore, um, or in the Baltimore system, rather, uh, Frederick keys, uh, cl- uh, class a plus, uh, Carolina league. Then you were at the Delmarva shorebirds class, a South Atlantic league. And then, um, and then the unfortunate happened where you were released and you became a free agent. Now it's a little different when you're traded and you're trying to see who you're traded for Alex. Now, when you're released, you know, the feeling again, and I keep asking this because obviously you've, you've felt it all, whether it be getting drafted very late, getting traded and, you know, who knows? You could have been traded. They say there could have been a massive trade and you could have been, you know, that little diamond in the rough in, in that big deal. But now you get released. What was that feeling like for you? I was actually in another country. Um, I think it was like four in the morning there. I went up to go to the bathroom and I get back into my room and I look at my phone. And it's a phone call from uh, from the team. Another 10 second conversation. Really, I didn't even get to say one word, and it was over. So uh, I think they did it on purpose, just so you can't say anything back. They just say, basically, you're released, and then they hang up the phone. So uh, pretty pretty crazy. And uh, I They don't know. caught you at the right time when you had to use the bathroom. Yeah, I don't know if I uh, – yeah. I wonder maybe if I didn't answer the phone, would I not have been released? Um, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of interesting to think about. But um, I think the first thing I thought of – was you know I was obviously something I can't control just um just got to keep working and hopefully sign with a new team and then obviously the White Sox called and up re-signing with them a few weeks later right so then yeah and then eventually um you know cats out of the bag uh you went back to uh to the White Sox and then uh and then eventually your your little journey back to Major League Baseball took a little bit of a turn and it went to independent ball and to a place where guys out here on Long Island six World Series New York, you played with you you uh you played played under him uh, as the manager now. Playing for uh, a former Met and entering the Atlantic League uh, at the same time as you. Let's hear it. Oh, you broke up again. You're playing for the Long Island Ducks. Talk about that feeling. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're cutting out here and there a little bit. Yeah, no, I think I heard most of the question. Um, you're just, okay, you're talk- yeah. It was just about uh, the feeling playing for the, the home, hometown Long Island Ducks under uh, manager Wally Backman. Exactly. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I got released by the White Sox. I, I had a feeling it had to do with velocity because I, w- I was thrown really well during spring training, but my velocity was down for some reason. It was frustrating because I didn't know why. I felt good. You know, I, I you know, my mechanics were, were pretty good. Um I was throwing slower than I did. Uh, I was throwing like 86, 88. I'm usually 92, 94. Uh, so that's obviously a big difference. And I completely understood why I got released, you know? So there were a few weeks between being released and the long on duck season. They usually start later April. So, um, you know, pretty much just made some adjustments with my mechanics and rested for a couple of weeks, took it nice and easy. And um, I didn't originally, I didn't, get a contract from the ducks. I had to try out because they really only give try out or give contracts to the triple a guys and the guys with big league experience. It's that good of a league. So um, I went there as a spring training invite and I, and I threw really well, was throwing hard again, was back to 94 and I made the team. Um, and I didn't pitch much at first early on in the year. I was pitching like once a week, even though I was putting up, uh, you know, putting up really good numbers. Um, 
and, you know, finally earn my spot because, you know, they obviously pitched the veteran guys ahead of me. And um, after a few weeks, I became one of the main guys and just started pitching a lot more. And um, it, w- it, was a, it was a good experience there. It was better competition than any um, low A, high A baseball that I played, you know, in a lot of guys I was pitching against had time in the big leagues, uh, time in Mexico, time in Japan. These guys know what they're doing. And obviously, Wally Backman's a legend. You know, he, he's a player's coach. The guys love playing for him and uh, brings a lot to the table. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, for those for those that uh, that are Ducks fans that are watching uh, are, or avid Ducks fans, if you will, uh, Alex Katz, 13 games, uh, 15 and a third innings pitch, 13 strikeouts. Um, win-loss record was, uh, was zeros across the board, but still playing for your hometown Ducks. Um, pretty cool experience because not only that, as I did say, I think we were cut off before, um, the drive home is, and literally home, you don't, you know, you don't have to rent an apartment or go to a hotel or anything like that, uh, or stay with anybody. You can literally go to your bedroom where you are now. And, uh, what was that feeling like? You're still playing baseball and you're playing it at a high level and you could still be home. Yeah. I think as soon as I got drafted, I, I quickly realized that the next time I'll be, um, playing baseball and at home at the same time was when I was going to play at either Yankee stadium or city field as a road, as a road player, um, you know, either with the Orioles or white Sox. But, um, you know, I, I never thought that I'd be playing for the ducks and, uh, and living at home. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you, you think about it and, and really, you know, when you get drafted, especially in, in, uh, in Chicago, when you're going out to play in Arizona, you're on the other side of the country. Um, you know, so there's no, there is no returning. And that was actually a question I believe we actually asked um, Anthony Iaposi too, because, you know, when, um, during this whole thing, when you're out on the other side of the country and you hear this, uh, you know, that spring training is canceled and everything along those lines, um, you know, the feeling is just, I can't even imagine. And that was the next thing I was going to bring up. Um, You know, we're missing a humongous part um, of your journey and we'll get to that in a second, but you then signed with the Kansas city Royals where your shirt says right now, the Royals, that's who you're repping right now on February 12th, 2020. So that's about roughly three and a half months ago. And this pandemic started about roughly about two. So your first spring training with them, uh, with Kansas city, and you're familiar with a few of those guys, uh, such as uh, current second baseman, uh, Nicky Lopez, uh, who's also a part of your uh, stadium custom kicks uh, journey as well. We'll get to that in just a moment as well. But now, Alex, I want to know amid this whole thing, you get the phone call or do you get the phone call? What do you hear when all of this becomes or when all of this gets canceled? I think we might've lost Alex for just one second. So for those that are. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, there we go. No, it's all good. It's all good. It happens. You see when you, you see what happens when you live at home, things just random. Everyone exactly. just randomly comes into, into your room. Exactly. Can you repeat that question? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so for those, so as we did say earlier, um, you signed with the Kansas city Royals, February 12th, 2020, uh, three months. Uh, it's been about three and a half months since you've been with uh, the Royals. And uh, you're getting the call saying that it's completely canceled amid this whole pandemic. Um, let's hear before, let's, let's go to the positive part first. You get signed um, or you sign a minor league deal with the Royals. And, uh, and this is your first spring training with a brand new ball club. You obviously were, you were, excuse me, uh, traded from Chicago, then released by Baltimore, and then re-signed with Chicago. So now you're heading to your third, um, your third organization. Completely different, um, completely different facilities, completely different people, and completely different coaches. So let's talk about um, the the you know the continued journey to Major League Baseball. And now you're playing uh, um, with the Royals, and uh, and during this again during this whole pandemic what is is going through your mind yeah so 
I, I, you know, it never crossed my mind that our season will be postponed or any of this going on right now would have, um, would have been going down, you know, even, even hearing about this happening in other countries and, um, you know, hearing about the coronavirus hitting a lot of countries, um, even on my flight to Arizona, I didn't think anything would ever happen or I didn't think it would even hit the United States, to be honest. I think most people didn't either, but, um, really just getting into the swings of things. Um, you know, I was enjoying my time with a new organization. They, you know, they, they, they treat us well over there, uh, learning a lot, meeting a lot of, um, really good people over there. I only threw two bullpens and then was about to throw against hitters and live VPs. And, um, you know, that's when everything took a turn. Yeah. Not only, not only everything taking a turn, but now again, when, when did you find out or how did you find out that it was Um, canceled? It was kind of weird. So with the Royals, the minor leaguers and the big leaguers share the weight room. So we all lift in the big weight room. And um, I believe the whole, a lot of the big league team was in there at the time I was working out. A lot of the big league coaches, including Mike Matheny, I believe were in there. And I look at the TVs because the treadmills and the bikes have TVs, you know, so while you're doing your cardio, you can watch. ESPN was on it. It said, breaking news, Major League Baseball season postponed, spring training canceled immediately. And I think um, – it like became dead silent. And then like the big leaguers went to the clubhouse and they had a meeting. Um, so I have a feeling something, you know, I not really a feeling. I, I saw that something crazy was going on. Um, I think it was a day or so after the NBA season was postponed. Um, they basically said like, Hey, hang around for three or four days. Um, we weren't allowed to go to the, to the um, facility. We basically just hung out at the hotel for a few days. They brought us food there. They had food trucks come to the parking lot. And, um, I thought maybe it would just be like a week or, or a week or two. We would just hang out in Arizona, um, just stay in shape, you know, run, just run and throw in the parking lot of the hotel or something. Um, but once I, once I heard that friends from other organizations were being sent home, um, I had a feeling that we would be sent home as well. Now you're, you're being sent home. Did they, did they tell you that you could have stuck around or did they really want you to go home? No, we had to go home unless we had nowhere to go. You know, some guys are from Venezuela and they really couldn't get, go home. Um, even some guys from Europe couldn't go home immediately, but I think some of those guys did go home. So, um, you know, I don't know, 190, 200 players in the organization, I'd say, 98% of them went home. Yeah. Well, again, lucky that you were able to get a flight back really quick uh, here to Long Island because, um, you know, obviously it's been, it's been two months and counting and um, you know, we won't go into the um, you know, into the details with, with baseball for right now um, with everything going on, but let's stick to a more positive route and, uh, and where you were in 2017. And for those that have not watched the last dance and Alex, I'm going to take a wild, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a shot in the dark here. I'm going to say you watched the last dance. Yep. Yep. Okay, good. So for those, so for those, I'm not going to spoil anything. So we'll go all the way from, uh, 2020 back to, uh, 2017. And, you know, we'll keep going back here and there. Uh, try and keep it as organized as possible. But uh, the 2017 World Baseball Classic, Team Israel. Now, this means something to you. Um, there's there's no bigger feeling of not only having um, a dual citizenship with Israel, but you're playing with fellow, um, you know, fellow big leaguers, uh, Ryan LaVarnway, Ike Davis uh, from the Mets at the time, um, and then obviously with the Oakland Athletics. Um you played for team Israel in Japan and talk about the journey to get to the world baseball classic. Yeah. So I was invited to play on the qualifying team in fall of 2016. And um, we, you know, we won all three games. Um, I I didn't pitch in any of those games. They, they only pitched. I was the second youngest on the whole team. They pretty much just pitched to veteran guys. Um, But it, it was still, you know, in something like that, it's all about the team. Nothing, you know, 
there's no I at all. It's all about the team, you know, especially when you're representing something so great as a whole country. So that was an amazing feeling to win that uh, qualifier. Um, a few weeks later, or maybe a few months later, um, I, I, you know, I received a phone call that I, that I made the, the roster for the main tournament. So um, that was a super, super exciting um, time, especially to, um, to go from pitching in single A ball, 3,000 fans maybe, to now uh, 50, 60,000 fans on the world stage in a tournament against big leaguers that I grew up watching. And if I'm not mistaken, obviously, when you guys pitched in, in Japan, it was the uh, the infamous Tokyo Dome. Yeah, so we started off in Korea at the Sky Dome in Seoul, Korea, and then we won the first round and pitching, uh, and I, we ended up playing the Tokyo Dome. And growing up, um, Tokyo, Japan, and visiting the Tokyo Dome, watching a game there was the number one uh, place or country that I wanted to visit. That's crazy. And... Uh, and for, I, I think I remember because you were on, um, you were on the, uh, the New York pro scouts channel with, uh, with Jesse Manning, I believe last week or the week before. And, uh, and I believe he did ask this, but I still will ask it anyway. Um, the, uh, the Korean baseball league obviously is going on right now. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe you had, or he had asked you if, uh, if you stay up to watch that. And I believe you said no, cause it was a little late, right? Yeah. I watched, uh, one or two games, but, um, you know, the, the time is just is crazy. You know, I, I can't be staying up that late every single night. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So, you I know, would, obviously I, that I, is. I wish that they repeated it at a more reasonable time. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's more for the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the insomnia um, f- uh, folks that are out there. But um, so again, you, you going to the world stage and pitching in the world baseball classic, um, you know, pitching in the Tokyo Dome. Now, I got to ask this because you've been around um, Major League Baseball. You've been around, um, you know, the Big East and all throughout here in the States. Now you go again to the world stage and you go to the Tokyo Dome in a comp- on the other side of the world. Biggest difference that you thought um, that you thought at the time was what? Between baseball in America and baseball over there. I think, um, and also the fans too. I think the fans is the most the most obvious thing. Um, they don't have walkout songs blasting through the speakers. They have bands in the outfield and cheerleaders dancing to that walk up song throughout the player's whole at bat. So you know if Mike Trout is wow, hitting, really. So Mike Trout will have his own walk up song from that band, and fans will be cheering, and the band will be playing that song throughout all of his at bat, which is pretty crazy. Um, you know, usually it gets kind of quiet in America, um, after the walk-up song is played, um, you know, maybe just some white noise or, um, you know, fans cheering or yelling, but like super, super loud music, you know, not even through the, obviously not through the speakers, just around the whole stadium. Cause there's seats in the outfield and, and the infield. Um, so it was, it was unlike any other, uh, baseball game, baseball games that I've ever played in. Um, as far as the style of baseball, um, you know, they pretty much just pitch backwards. You know, they're throwing they're throwing junk when they're behind the count, early in the count, um, you know, just whenever. So I think that there's an advantage for American pitchers. I think if we pitch to our to our American style, it really um, it makes it hard for some of those hitters over there. Yeah. So you pitched um four games i believe there um three and a third innings um and when you were there and you step foot on the mound and you hear all of these you know uh all the music and you hear the band and you hear music all around you something completely different from what you are used to um you know in your 20 plus years on this earth and playing baseball what was the biggest I would say difference for you that you had to adjust to as a pitcher. I think just controlling my adrenaline. I've never pitched with that much adrenaline before. Even, and, and even with the, even with all of the music going on and everything, 
because obviously we are used to being quiet during, during the at bat. And now with all of this, you had to control the adrenaline. There wasn't any other, any other problems that, or I guess issues that arose when you were on the mound. No, but the craziest thing is that the bullpens are underground underneath a dugout and it's just soundproofing on the walls and the ceiling. So it felt like we we're in our living room watching the game on TV and then, you know, no adrenaline. And then five seconds later, um, running out of the dugout and it's crazy, you know, crazy loud. And uh, I think the adrenaline hits harder because you're going from a dead silent room to now a, a stadium full of, full of noise. That's crazy. Um, so one last, one last major league baseball question that I do would, I would like to ask here and normally a day in the life you'd figure, um, of Alex Katz in spring training. And also while you were, um, abroad, if you will, um, in Japan. Now I had asked you the difference between, um, the college ranking of uh, the college ranks, and then now to minor league baseball. Now I'm going to ask you this. So now from minor league baseball, uh, what would a day in the life on game day of Alex Katz be um, in Japan? Game day in Japan. I gotta, I gotta think back a few years. I've played a lot of games since then. Um, I don't know. I think we played day games and night games. I'll, I'll talk about a night game. Um, I believe in Japan, I, um, I walked to get food a lot. So there, there was a lot of good food places around there. I thought that there'd be a lot of teriyaki chicken, you know, that's like Americanized <laughs> Japanese food, but there's a lot of pork. They eat a lot of pork over there. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot of fun to eat, eat at, um, restaurants over there because you're not supposed to tip. It's like frowned upon the tip. So you could literally go restaurant hopping. Yes, and I've heard that. Eat at two or three different restaurants. And, you know, it works because you're not giving a five, ten dollar tip um, you know, every time you eat. You know, you just you could grab something light at one and go to the next place and try it. So I think I did that a lot for dinner. Um, you know, for lunch. I don't really remember exactly what I ate for lunch. Um, I think we might have eaten lunch at the ballpark because for night game we would get there pretty early. Um, I know at the Tokyo Dome in the clubhouse, they had a chef and a, a little cafeteria there. So um, they had a, a assortment of food for us to eat. And then we would take batting practice, um, go back in the clubhouse. I think maybe they would have some light snacks before the game. Um, and, you know, then we would obviously have the game and come back to the hotel. I think that's when I would uh, go back and w walk with a few of the guys on the team. Um, and check out some of the restaurants. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Especially a brand new, brand new country, a uh, completely different continent. And again, being on the other side of the world in a place where you've uh, you were never there. I'm assuming that was your first ever time in Japan. Yeah. First time in Japan and something to add it. It's pretty cool to walk around the streets in Japan. Um, you know, just looking in the restaurants and, and the bars and the cafes and, seeing the, the other world baseball classic games being played on TV. And, you know, those people, you know, don't notice you. We obviously stick out, you know, as Americans, we stick out in uh, foreign countries. So, um, you know, just walking by and, you know, thinking that those people, you know, they obviously don't realize that those people they're watching on TV are the same people that are just walking on the sidewalk right next to them. That's, um, that's wild. Yeah. And then us from our perspective thinking, you know, like we're going to be, they're going to be watching us on TV in just in a few hours. So um, it, it is pretty cool. Now you actually just said that, and that was actually, and that's a perfect segue into the next question that I want to ask you because you, you're, you're, you're a Mets fan. I'm, I'm, I believe. Yeah. I grew up a Mets fan. Okay. So yeah. Right. And I know if I'm not mistaken um, from what I remember you had told me when we had met, um, and also, I had to confirm that um, on the St. John's website as well. Your favorite athlete then, and I don't know if it's changed, was Southpaw Johan Santana. Yeah, I'd say Billy Wagner and Johan Santana were two of my favorite um, baseball players growing up. So now let's, let's see a comparison from fan to player. Yep. What is the feeling like? 
going from fan to player. How weird is that for you or was weird for you? Um, I think the weirdest, not really weird. The coolest thing was, um, you know, g- going to the complexes or having games and then, um, you know, having guest instructors like Jim Tomey and guys like that, um, you know, just going about their business, um, you know, just coaching the guys. I mean, most of the time as a fan, you see those guys, there's, you know, hundreds of fans trying to get close to them, get their autograph. And obviously the players can't be themselves in those atmospheres. You know, they, you know, they're, um, they obviously are acting, they obviously people naturally act different when they're around people they feel more comfortable around or maybe around um, their friends or, or family, stuff like that. You know, I feel like you have to, um, you know, um, you know, you're just more loose when you're around people you feel comfortable with. So um, to see guys with, you know, big name guys like that, um, who I'd probably be chasing around for autographs as a kid, you know, now being in the same uh, work environment as them is a, uh, is a pretty cool feeling. And also someone who's also been enshrined into the baseball hall of fame too, teaching you how to play or, or watching um, or watching him teach others how to play right. You know, just right in front of you uh, must be surreal uh, to see that, you know, right in the flesh. Now, a a business move for you, and this is the biggest the biggest thing here on the docket for Alex Katz. And uh, Alex, you're putting your sport management major to work here, and you started something called Stadium Custom Kicks. And um, this is this to me is phenomenal because I've seen multiple people wear your cleats, and. I'm talking to the one who I've seen on television and we've seen Carly Lloyd, uh, Corey Levin. There is just, this is, you know, and again, now major league baseball teammate for you, uh, Nikki Lopez as well, as we were talking about, um, the list goes on for you. Um, Felix Hernandez, uh, Felix Hernandez, King Felix. Uh, and also if I'm not mistaken, your, your new, business made david wright's final pair of cleats yeah he uh he hung up the cleats that we painted for him and um you know like we mentioned before i I grew up a mets fan and david wright was in his prime when i was growing up so that was that was definitely one of the coolest projects that we've had you got cut off there say just say that one more time we heard david wright yeah, so and growing up it. a Mets fan, you know, David Wright was one of my idols growing up. So that, that was a really cool, um, a really cool uh, moment. Yeah. So how, how did this all start for you? How did Stadium Custom Kicks become uh, what it is today? Yeah, I mean, it just started off. I wanted some cleats for the World Baseball Classic. And, um, you know, I thought it was a good opportunity to get custom cleats because I was with the White Sox and we had to wear solid black cleats, not pitching in front of many fans. So, um, you know, being on the world stage and, you know, in just the environment that I was going to be in, um, obviously no rules on on cleats. I, I thought it'd be a cool time to um, to customize my cleats. And, you know, I didn't really know anyone that, that did it. So, you know, I, I pretty much just did it myself. Um you know, I guess I, I guess I knew some people that did it, but it was kind of last minute and I didn't think I had time before the tournament to, um, to send them in. So I just paint them, paint them with a friend and they came out good and just opened up an Instagram account, got all my friends and, um, family to follow us. And then they started ordering, you know, we were charging them 10 bucks just to cover the materials. We still didn't really know what we were doing. And, um, you know, just over time we grew, um, you know, a lot of a lot of my teammates and friends of teammates have ordered and continue to order. And, you know, now we've gone to a point where we have 10 artists. So it it's uh, definitely grown over the last few years. Yeah. Grown, grown is an understatement. And for those uh, I brought this up, actually, on, a, on my podcast, um, you know, where where you have you have entrepreneurs like yourself, um, you know, going to and and uh, and, and showing what they have in terms of 
you know, showcasing their product, if you will, on Shark Tank. And you didn't even have to do that. You, you came out there and you took the bull by the horn. And now, if I'm not mistaken, just by looking at this account here, is this, is this right, Alex? 700,000 followers? 700,000 followers in that range? No, 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 no about 90,000. Which, which page are you looking at? Hold on one second. I could have sworn I – hold on one second. I got I have to see this. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I got to check this, my phone. Did we just gain – yeah, I mean, let me followers. see because we're having like I said, like I said, we're having we're having we're having a lot of problems here with our internet here. So we're uh let me see if if I'm looking at the right at the right page here. But so so we'll 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 go with your answer here with uh seven you said 70. Hold on, let's see. Or 80, in 90, sorry, 80, 89.1. So 89,100. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so exactly. in, in I wish we I, I, sorry, I wish I, I wish we had 700,000. In due time, in due time you will, that's for sure. So again, right. So so just by looking at this and uh and I do apologize, I'm going to give you give you a follow. I don't know why I never did that. Um but 89,101 now. Um let's go. To, yeah. To to, to get to where you are now, you've been featured on um, multiple multiple platforms. And when we say platforms, we don't only mean social media. We mean the MLB network. Um, and you made an appearance um, this past January, and you spoke with Matt Vaskersian. Um, and we all know who he is, the voice of Sunday Night Baseball uh, on ESPN. And you got to sit down and you got to speak with him and speak about your your journey to making stadium custom kicks. And talk about how it's evolved to blossom to the other major sports around the country and the globe. Yeah, so we, we definitely grew the fastest in baseball just because of my, my personal connections, understanding of the industry, and um, baseball baseball world is super small. Everybody knows each other. So even the guys who I – personally i've never met you know we might know of each other or have connections you know mutual connections so um you know everybody knows somebody that knows somebody um it really is a small world so um you know just just doing work for a few guys now all their friends and teammates and their, their followers um will see that and um you know it, it kind of it kind of just grew off social media, the power of social media and being able to spread a message fairly, fairly quickly um, has grown the business. And, um, you know, we, we started with working with a few other NFL players and, um, you know, just growing through social media and networking with other people in the football industry. Um, so we're definitely trying to be as big in other sports as we are in baseball. And um, that's obviously a work in progress. Well, I was going to say, you, you say work in progress, but I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and again, I, I did, I did mess up here with, uh, with that on Instagram. So let me, I'm going to ask you this question. And from what I saw on that same exact account, U S women's national soccer team player, Carly Lloyd, am I, is that right? Yeah, she actually rocked our custom cleats. I think the last game of this past season. Um, That's unbelievable. Yeah, no, that was that was pretty cool. I think uh, I think there's a lot of markets that we haven't really tapped into. Um, there's so many sports out there, even professional sports. There's so many different leagues and sports throughout the whole world, um, and we obviously work with athletes and um, you know people in all different countries. So I think um, there's a lot of room for growth there. Yeah. And, and you can continue to grow. I don't know how much higher you can get with Carly Lloyd, you know, before, Hey, listen, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Cristiano Ronaldo gets a pair of these, uh, a pair of these cleats. This is, this is something, uh, this is, this, this is amazing. And um, you know, with, with everything going on and the, um, the uncertainty, and I don't mean to, you know, to, to add fuel to the fire for those that are watching and has heard of the, uh, the minor league cuts today, but um, you know, you look at you look at God forbid a um, a fallback option here. Yeah, Alex, 
and you know, this is, this is phenomenal what you've, what you've started here. And obviously, you know, I, 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 I truly wish you the best in terms of, um, you know, your career, um, moving forward. But again, seriously, this is, the, do you believe, or did you ever think that something like this would evolve to what it is today? No, not at all. I mean, I, I pretty much just started the company, um, really as a joke you know like kind of like a side hustle you know maybe i'd make ten dollars here and there um and that was kind of what it was the first year you know i, I didn't really make much money but you know it covered my chipotle bills um <laughs> but no I, I i you know hopefully i'll be having the same conversation in five ten years and even make fun of myself now for not um visualizing what it's going to uh, you know eventually become so um, you know, obviously it has grown a little bit bigger than I thought. And, you know, I hope that it continues to grow because, you know, I, I, I don't ever want to be content. I, I want to be happy. You know, I want to be a happy person and uh, be grateful for whatever I've done and, you know, whoever has helped me get to where I am. But, you know, I feel like there's always room for improvement. And I feel like that's the only way to get better at something is to, um, is to not feel content. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because there's always, there's always room for growth. And, uh, and especially, um, as you spoke about earlier, you know, when you win that first championship, you want more and you're hungry for more. And especially for you, when you sell your first pair of cleats, you want to keep selling them. And that is what you're doing. And you're doing it at a fast, fast pace, my friend. Um, really, really good stuff. Now, uh, um, as we head into the, uh, uh, into the, the uh, into the eighth inning of this interview here um, now and where we've been um, you know we've been cooped up at home you sir have made uh, a fantastic um, bullpen in your in your own backyard that's that that that, that I think is the coolest thing um, and what you've done is again surreal but for those that do not have that luxury or that privilege, if you will, um, with crummy weather today and being told to stay in for any young aspiring athlete, especially baseball player, um, you know, who may mentally be on the downfall, if you will, mentally or physically because of this pandemic. And it's, it's, it's obvious, um, or it's inevitable, if you will, um, that things could potentially happen to those, um, you know, if they don't keep their, uh, their head up straight or head up high, if you will. Um, what's your advice to those that do not have the luxury that both, you know, you or I do where we could be outside or um, in your case, uh, have a bullpen in your backyard? I think it's just to be optimistic and realize that better times will be there. Um, you know, in, you know, in your whole lifetime, we're going to look, you know, maybe even a, f a, a few months down the, down the line, you know, looking back at, at this time period, you know, this pandemic, it really is such a small sample size in, in you know, in someone's life. So, um, you know, you can't really, you have to think maybe a little bit more long-term here and, and just realize that it's such a, a small percentage of your whole life, you know, you have a whole life to live. Um, I don't think a couple of months or even four or five months, um, you know, really, you know, it, it really all depends on how you, how you take it. Um, you know, obviously it's different if, if you lost a loved one or if someone got really sick during this time, um, you know, that obviously is totally different than someone who's, who's not been affected like that. Um, I feel like everybody's been affected in some way, whether, you know, they lost a job or, um, you know, they, they have to, um, you know, sanitize their house a thousand times a day, or, you know, maybe their, their business that they built up for the last 30 years, you know, is in shambles. Um, I feel like everybody throughout the whole world has been affected in, in, in some way, but, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of positive things can be done in this time. Um, you know, I feel like ideas that you've had, you could really go ahead and, 
and get them going. I feel like there's going to be a lot of new businesses that come out of this. People are going to be home working on them. Um, it's also an opportunity to give back to people that really need help. So um, I think everybody's in a different situation. And I feel like there's a, no matter what bad thing happens in this world, there's always a positive that comes out of it. Yeah. There's always, there's, there's always some silver lining there. Um, now, because of, again, not only everything that's gone on here, but um, just throughout your whole life, um, the people that you want to thank the most for getting you to where you are today in, ba in a baseball sense, um, biggest inspiration um, in a baseball sense for you, Alex, would be who? I'd say, I'd say my whole family. Um, my sisters and my mom and dad have been super, super supportive of my career. And, um, you know, obviously can't thank them enough. And they continue to support me. Um, you know, I know how close I am to making it to the big leagues. Um, you know, being at the upper levels of the minor leagues, I, uh, you know, in a few years deep in my career, I know how close I am. And, and they realize that they still need to keep supporting my baseball career. Um, if they want me to make it, you know, you can't, you can't make it by yourself. You know, you, you need somebody there to help you. It, it's really hard to uh, make it far in life by yourself. You know, no matter how little that support is, you know, if it's a little support, or a lot of support, it, it all can go a long way. Yeah, that's uh, that, that is pretty good because uh, you know, when you have your parents behind you the whole time, that's uh, and your family, not only your parents, your whole entire family. Um, that's really amazing. Again, when some people have to do it themselves, you have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have uh, a couple of sisters, if I'm right? Yeah, I have two older sisters. That sound right to you, Alex? A couple of sisters you have? Yeah. Two older sisters, right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's like, again, really amazing where you have uh, four others that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're just having a little, again, a little uh, internet issue. Tried to figure this out. I don't know. We're doing the best we can, but for those again, that are uh, keeping, keeping up here, uh, we do see a, do see on the, on the anal analytics chart. We do have a whole bunch of viewers here still hanging in there. So we do appreciate that both uh, Alex Katz and myself really do appreciate it again. Uh, 15 minutes past the top of the hour, um, nine o'clock, nine 15 here, uh, on the East coast. Again, that's Alex Katz. I'm Joey Drozinka. We're almost finished here. We are in the top of the ninth inning of this interview here. Um, and really again, things have come out today. We will not, uh, in a little rapid fire, if you will, uh, going back to the, uh, to the interview with the scouts, um, do we see you pitching this year and do we see baseball back either? Yes or no. I think yes. Okay. All right. All right. That's, that is, I, okay. All right. All right. That's good. Um, so now we'll head into the bottom of the ninth here. And uh, we've asked this question to everybody. Um, going back to personal projects um, with St. Francis College, Brooklyn, behind the Terriers, we've asked uh, head coach, uh, uh, women's basketball head coach, Linda Simino, what her favorite uh, ice cream was. We've asked NBC Sports California's Brett Hedekin what his favorite ice cream was, and we got these responses. Uh, Americone, uh, Ben and & Jerry's, and we've also got mint chocolate chip. We also had uh, from Jake Zimmer, we've gotten, uh, we've gotten cookie dough as well. Um, so now I shall ask you this, Alex Katz, because we have been keeping a tally and we need something to look forward to, but you do say that baseball is coming back or you believe that you will be pitching again this year. So in addition to that being said, what is your favorite ice cream flavor that you're most looking forward to, to having possibly right after uh, we're off here? Um, I actually just had a scoop of ice cream before this. Oh, okay. but not not my favorite flavor um it was butter pecan but okay uh, my favorite flavor is probably vanilla soft serve with rainbow sprinkles Ooh, okay all right that's that is uh and i gotta, think, gotta love it right yeah that is pretty good and, and you know what and i will add 
I will ask this, um, you know, we're, 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 we're not there. There is no, uh, you know, advertising here, but we'll still ask it anyway, because, you know, we're not that big yet, but uh, is that a, is that a Carvel soft serve, Mr. Softy soft serve, because we are here on, in, uh, in New York. So I got to ask that. Um, when it comes to some, some place local, I have to say Marvell in Long Beach. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, I love. You, have you ever like been that. there? That's I haven't been there in. Okay. I think I was there once, and uh, watching. So we'll leave. We'll leave it at that. I'll I'll tell you after uh, after this. But uh, yes, I, I I was there once. Um, there. So um, yeah, we'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, Alex. <laughs> Final question here. Um, now we, we we asked you we asked you about um, the last dance earlier and going back and forth and everything. Um, in addition to you know keeping uh, keeping yourself hot and everything, uh, keeping your uh, keeping your arm in shape, keeping everything in shape, um, you know, staying warm if you will. Um, quality family time. This is com- this is completely different territory for you, especially within the last uh, five years for you. Um, c- more quality time, house projects that you're doing, um, watching The Last Dance, other uh, Netflix series, um, any other hobbies that you've picked up uh, during this uh, two month uh, hiatus, if if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think family time is super super important, but. I feel like I've been home for way too long, you know, since, since I've been released, I played for the ducks, lived at home and then was home all off season. So, um, as much as I love my family, I would definitely, uh, much rather be playing ball right now. Um, as far as, as far as housework, um, building the bullpen in my backyard took about a month. I, uh, chopped down four trees all by hand with a handsaw, did not have a chainsaw. And uh, had to uh, de-root all of those trees. So that took a while. I think I lost a few pounds doing that. Um, that was a lot of work. And obviously leveling, leveling out the ground and doing a lot of landscaping. Um, that was pretty much all the housework that I plan on doing um, right now. Um, maybe the longer it takes, I'll, uh, I'll start doing more. But. You know, I don't know if my family would be too happy if I start taking apart the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you just start and you just make like a, 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 a like a little stadium or something like that. That would be pretty good. Um, and then they'd have to live in the uh, in the clubhouse or in the batting cages or anything like that. That would be uh, that would be something for sure. Um, so that's really good to hear. You know, now now that you're home and uh you know as as you did say before you know with you being home last year when you were with the ducks um you know now it's now it's like all right alex get out you know get out again we liked uh, we liked the first couple of years when you were on the road and everything now uh, now we're seeing you too much uh a little bit so uh but really 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 good stuff. Again, all joking aside, um, you know, I'm really happy to, to, uh, to, you know, speak with you again and, um, and, you know, you continue doing your thing, keep making sure that, uh, that, that this stadium custom kicks just keeps on growing. And eventually you're going to get to 700,000, uh, Instagram followers. I'm almost I, certain because I, thought, I was, uh, I thought we went viral. From the- I thought we went viral and I looked back at my phone to well, see if, if we, uh, if we gained that many in, 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 a, in an hour. Yeah. Well, Hey, listen, that, say that would be something because then we'd be going viral too. Um, <laughs> so, so for those that, uh, so for those that are still with us here, Alex, please let us know, um, where we can find stadium custom kicks, uh, social media website, please give us all the, uh, the information. Yep. So stadium custom um, we have a lot of designs on there, all different sports, and you could just order straight from the website. Otherwise, at Stadium Custom Kicks on Instagram and at Stadium S or at Stadium CK on Twitter. That's perfect. Well, for those for those that uh, that want to know more about Stadium Custom Kicks, uh, we will be posting. Um, and also he'll begin. Did you have, uh, did you have another page in the beginning when you first started this? What was that? 
say, did you have say with Stadium Custom Kicks? Did you have another page uh, before before this one? Yeah, with my old company, and then we obviously rebranded. That's it. That's what I have. That's what I was thinking originally. Okay, right. Okay, so now now you're going to be re uh, you're going to be getting all all the follows from me again. So again, uh, I do want to apologize in advance for uh, for um, flooding your uh, your social media accounts, but. Um, we're going to be retweeting everything from you just so all of our followers and viewers from this evening, uh, can see and to, uh, you know, go shopping. Hey, listen, economy's starting to get back up. Maybe spend awesome. some money on, uh, we gotta support our, custom kicks. That, we got to support would, our local businesses, right? Small businesses, support your small businesses. That's right. Exactly. And, uh, and here on long Island, Alex, Ka- Al- Alex Katz is, uh, and his local business ladies and gentlemen that is alex katz kansas city royals prospect pitcher uh alex i can't thank you enough for joining me here this evening um on the prime time rundown zoom interview series you know i do apologize for the uh for the internet issues um you know obviously it can't be perfect um you know amid this whole thing it is raining outside and you know there's probably eight zillion people on the internet and flooding the uh the uh the the internet lines around here or maybe where you are or both so um i do thank you sincerely awesome thank you for having me definitely enjoyed being on i'm really really happy to hear that so before so before alex before you do go closing credits though episode number five of the essential wrestling podcast uh comes to you next tuesday uh, June 2nd, right here on the Eastern Observer. That will start at 6 p.m. Join Tyler Adell and Al Carl as they speak about the past week in wrestling. And then also episode number 17 of this show, the Primetime Rundown Zoom interview series uh, with New York Boulder's brand and ambassador John Thompson and Rockland Community College basketball public address announcer uh, will be joining us here 6 p.m. Monday, June 1st, right here on the Eastern Observer. Also follow us on our brand new Instagram account at the Eastern Observer. Also on Twitter at Observe Eastern, as well as liking our Facebook page at the Eastern Observer. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us at the Blackjack Media Networks, we'll see you next time. Good stuff, big man.